Welcome to another Tuesday VMR. We are excited to have you all here with us. Today I'm going to discuss, discuss with Ravi. And yeah, if you are with us for the first or second or third time, let us know. You are welcome. And yeah, Ravi, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing very well. I, I'm just very glad to be here today and uh, be able to co-discuss. I'm thinking about uh, back when you discussed uh, the first POCUS VMR. Remember the ginormous bladder that I showed, the cystocerebral uh, syndrome? So uh, it's great to join back with you and, and uh, do a VMR and co-discuss with you. So very happy to be here. And uh, yeah, you want to make an announcement? We have some February. We have some POCUS VMRs coming. Yeah, we are as like we are not having so much neuro VMR. We prepared like more focus case for February 14 and 21. Uh, we are gonna have amazing guests with no, we don't have Dr. Ria yet, Yasmin. We're gonna have Dr. Respreto and Dr. and Sanjay. So yeah, I hope you all can join us because we'll be amazing. And if you don't watch the videos that we had last year, watch because they were great too. So yeah, we'll be, we are ending January with great news for February. I'm looking forward. Yeah, I'm very excited for that. Yeah, some, some more focus cases. I think we built up a nice library of different cases and different images. If we stack all the episodes that are on YouTube together, we've done cardiac, we've done renal, we've done pulmonary, We've done bladder, we've done vascular. So we've done pretty much all the, the whole gamut of different organ systems. And I think it just makes your your uh, knowledge of POCUS that much stronger. So uh, we're, we're also jumpstarting uh, my institution, uh, the POCUS curriculum. So this perfectly aligns with that. I'll get my, my learners to also uh, watch those videos. But, um, oh, we forgot to make an announcement for a case. If anybody has a case, please step on up and uh, kindly, kindly share your case with us. Um, but I'll uh, uh, ask Madalena if if she's how she's doing. How was your weekend? My weekend was great. It's been um, really sunny in San Francisco here after um, some storms. So I went. There's this big park called Golden Gate Park. So I went there both days and went for some walks with friends. So I had a had a great weekend. And um, I guess we will just call it again to see if anyone has a case they would like to present. If not, we may have a backup case. Yasmin, how you been? Oh, I've been great, thank you. Like Texas got surprisingly cold in the last two days. We were, I still, I am not very good on Fahrenheit yet, but in Celsius, uh, we were like around the 40s or 30s or something. And now we we're like zero degrees Celsius. I'm so sorry, I don't speak Fahrenheit yet. Yeah, the wet weather patterns have been interesting around the country. The, the storm or ice storm, be careful when you're out there driving in Texas that you're getting this week. And then the rains up in Northern California have been quite devastating. Is that, did, did you come across that, Madalena? The, the, I saw some areas flooded. Yeah, even now when you walk around the city, there are some trees that are, have been falling down. It was, uh, it was very different, yeah. And um, Amanda, how you been? <clears throat> hello, hello guys. I'm fine, thank you. Here it's so hot. Today it's about 31 grad Celsius too. But it, it's a, a, a great season, but so hot. And anyone has a case? Does anyone has a case? It's a safe, safe space. Let's change experience. Yeah, I'm still trying to get over Amanda's brilliant facilitation of that case last week. You did so well. Uh, it was a pleasure to watch you uh, just shine in that case. Leah, long time no see. How you been? Hi, it's nice to see you guys too. I'm I'm good. I was also enjoying the sun today because we didn't have it for what feels like way too long, several weeks, and now I'm back. Um, and 
somebody just entered my room, so <laughs> but that's okay. Um, yeah, no, I think I'm a very, it's incredible how your mood just lifts when the sun is out. Like even if you're indoors or in the hospital walking, but you see the sun shining in, it just changes the mood of the day. So I'm glad the sun is back now. Awesome. You're absolutely right about that. Uh, as we transition to spring, it's just the, the mood just lifts up uh, a lot more. It gets Things get better. So the, the days become longer and the dark days are sort of dwindling. So that, uh, that uh, definitely is something to look forward to. I think Omaima has a backup case. If I guess time is running, if you like to meet yourself and also introduce yourself and uh, you can start with the case. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Ubaima. I'm a final year medical student from Morocco and I have a backup case. Uh, all right. So, uh, is the screen shared or not yet? I can't see it. All right. The chief complaint we have today is unilateral left leg swelling. Oh, very interesting. Uh, Deborah, you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, so um, unilateral leg swelling. Um, do, do, it's the left leg or the right leg? I would... Uh, the left leg. Huh? The left leg. The last leg, oh, okay. I would think first starting for how long time is being swelling. Um, think about if the patient is feeling something else. Um, if it's like, uh, if the patient is having some edema, if when that started, if the patient, if the has some erythema, if the patient has, uh, it's feeling any other part of the, the body like that, it had any fatigue, any associated symptoms, and I will ask if the patient had any trauma, if have any any infection, if have like some problem in the lymphatic system. If any, I, I could think about DVT too, as it's just unilateral. I'm missing something else. Yeah, I think uh, that's where I will start. What about you, Ravi? Yeah, I, I don't have much more else to say. It's kind of early in the process, so it's difficult to sort of focus in or hone in. Or uh, as I loved Ravi's example last week of uh, his dog zoning in or targeting the toy. So right now we sort of, you know, it, the focus is deviating side to side, trying to grasp for any little bit of um maybe evidence that we could latch on to to then hone us in on what could be causing this this swelling but you can't help but the system one thinking hans perfectly had mentioned in the chat that dvt comes to mind immediately if i go see somebody at unilateral leg swelling but you have to sort of take a back seat and think about it too could this be do i have enough of a pretest probability for dvt and uh, rather than sending the patient for a test to to um, try and diagnose it and um, and spend on um, some some extra money that uh, that uh, they they like is unlikely any any likelihood of patient having a DVT so we really have to think about it is is this uh, does a patient have uh, any uh, uh, predisposition to having a DVT like malignancy or immobilization post-operative state hypercoagulable state has they have have they had a DVT in the past are we dealing with some hematological issue, platelet issue, anything like that? Uh, but one thing that comes to mind, um, anatomical issues, I would go anatomically swelling. Is it in the skin, the vessel, it, like you said, so eloquently, the lymphatic system, which we sometimes don't really think about. Um, I would also think about um, something called May-Thurner syndrome. Um, I think uh, that uh, you, you tend to get... Um, I think on the left side, I don't know which side it is, but the left iliac vein crosses under the right iliac artery. So you tend to get swelling more so on the left side initially, like when you have congestion 
but there is a, a condition called Mathurner syndrome. I think it's equivalent in the upper arm. Um, I'm kind of forgetting is that there, there is swelling because of the rib or compression of the vessel in the upper extremity causing un, unilateral upper extremity edema. But something to think about. Back to you, uh, Amaima. No, just uh, a quick borrow that uh, I remember when I read in the chat from Anne-Marie that normally Reza says that the, the anatomically, the right iliac artery courses the left iliac vent. So we can have more edematostase in the left more than in the right. So that could be something to, that we should consider too. So yeah, back to you, Omega. All right. So our patient is a 29-year-old woman who presented with a swollen red left leg. The patient reported finding it hard to walk, uh, painful to walk a week ago, and over the past three days, the pain, uh, the pain started on her left foot and then ascended to her left leg, which became swollen, tender, and made it hard to walk. Um, shall I give you more history or stop here? I think we can go on to the history and we'll, okay. then we'll have Deborah discuss. All right. For the gynecological history, she had menarche at the age of 13 and she has regular menses. Uh, she's a para three and had no miscarriages or postnatal complications. Um, family history is significant for head and neck malignancy in her mom, but she recovered as uh, she is on remission now. And for the health-related behavior, she is a graduate student and she's been studying for ho from home for the past few weeks and reports stand, uh, sitting on her desk for more than six, eight hours uh, in a row. She must be preparing for step one. What do you think, Deborah? Yeah, that's... For, uh, the, the first thing that I thought for poor student no, is just studying and, and that happened. But um, so it's in the, the, the leg is red and the leg was found hard to walk and actually then becomes swelling very painful. So yeah, and the patient doesn't have any past medical history. So I think all, everything that we've, the, the diagnosis that we thought DVT, uh, cellulitis, and infection, I think we could think about that if the patient had like an exposure to, like that could be an infection. And yeah, and I will definitely go look for the DVT or and other some blood exams to check the coagulation of the patient. I think, yeah, that's. That's where I would go. Yeah, I love the the thought about again, uh, patient. If the patient's sitting, studying from home, maybe putting some compression on the vessel. So again, following the anatomical approach that you had mentioned, you have the vessel. Is there something within the vessel, or is there compression from outside the vessel? So you could add any number of things. You could have um, a, a on the vein. You could have a arterial aneurysm pushing. You could have a lymph node pushing, you could have a malignancy pushing and then causing increased pressure within the vein and extravasation of, of uh, fluid causing the edema. Again, lymphedema, I, uh, the exam will yield a lot of information that would help us determine where we should focus in on. Um, if I stop to think about re like life-threatening causes, yes, a DVT over a period of time can become life-threatening. There are two instances where, one instance where a DVT can actually extend not upwards, uh, prox I mean, uh, proximally, but distally and cause impairment of the arterial supply um, and cause um, almost like a, an ischemic leg. So I think it's Sorolia Dolan's, forgetting the term now, but it's funny when I can remember it, it just comes to me, but um Surya dolens and then Alba dolens. Alba is the white leg, and Surya dolens is where the the vascular, the arterial blood supply is um, at risk because of the v, the venous, uh, the DVT in the vein, then um, it, um, growing into the arteries and causing impairment of vascular or blood supply. Uh, cellulitis. I mean, a severe cellulitis could be. 
at play here, something to think about, what could be a life-threatening cause or, or a complication of cellulitis, something like um, necrotizing soft tissue skin infection, or I don't, I don't see any trauma or anything like that. So compartment syndrome can also be a life-threatening cause, but I, I'm not getting any sort of a, uh, a picture of this being something life-threatening, but although it can morph into something life-threatening if it's misdiagnosed. So a few things to think about, but um, I'm still wondering. Um, yep, phlegmasia is really a dullness. Thank you. Austin is filling in the gaps for me today. So the, the upper extremity equivalent of May Thurner is uh, Osgood Schroeder uh, syndrome. So he had mentioned it in the chat. So uh, the couple of things to think about, but I like what you mentioned, Deborah, that patient is sitting, uh, I don't know how many hours. And there was a good question in the chat. For, there's no meds that I see here, uh, but oral, oral contraceptives could be pro-thrombotics uh, or something to think about. And again, uh, the, the, at the top of our thinking here, DVT definitely comes into play, but we still have to also keep an eye on other potential causes mainly things that could be in the artery or outside the vein or within the skin, such as a cellulitis or a, a complication of cellulitis. Back to you, Maima. Uh, all right, she's not taking any oral contraceptives. She's using a copper IUD for um, contraception purposes. Okay, so uh, let's move to the physical exam. She's afibrile. Her temperature is 37.4. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, sorry. Uh, her blood pressure is 90, uh, sorry, uh, heart rate is 90, blood pressure is 120 over 60, and her SpO2 is 99. Uh, for uh, the, uh, on the physical exam, her left leg appears to be tender. There is diffuse erythema, and uh, did, there's tenderness application and diffuse erythema, and the human sign is positive. The rest of her physical exam is normal. Interesting, Deborah. How does this exam help us? Does it help us or does it do nothing for us? What do you think? Um, yeah, so the vitals, the patient is normal. So the last, yeah, help us. Like the diffuse erythema um, could, uh, we could think about the cellulitis and how much we could think uh, of the DVT. If I, I'm not saying wrong, that's, that could help us from our diagnosis that we were thinking. What do you think, Ravi? Yeah, uh, you're, you're right. The vital signs, is there a signature of a systemic process? I mean, DVT early on won't manifest uh, or affect uh, downstream the, the lungs or the oxygenation. There's no, well, the heart rate is in the upper limit of normal 90. There's no temperature. Sometimes you may get a low grade temp or a, a fever with the DVT and the blood pressures are stable. So if the patient had a PE, massive PE, those vital signs may be impaired. So the, the exam, again, is just the leg. There's no sign of any systemic involvement. There's tenderness, diffuse erythema. Holman sign, how does that help us? Do you remember, Deborah? Is, is that something that's useful? Uh, if I'm not wrong, like the Roma side, we, we, I don't know how to explain, we extend the leg and look at, I don't know how to explain in English, sorry. But I remember that it's for DVT. Yeah, something that was classically taught if there, if there is pain in the calf, um, especially when you're extending the foot or is it no flexing the foot? Uh, that could be uh, a potential positive sign of a DVT. Although I'm seeing in the chat, people are saying, and the line mentioned should not be elicited since it could displace the clot. There, there's always that possibility. And Austin has mentioned only as a likelihood ratio around one. So really not helpful. If it is positive, it does put a question mark in your mind as there could be presence or something. But there are many things, if you have cellulitis, that could be very painful. If you have a hematoma, it can be very painful. You have a baker cyst, it can be very painful. So many other possibilities could elicit a positive Holman's-like sign. So again, I don't think it does anything really for us. So we're still left with this big bag of, of many diagnoses. 
And uh, I think now we'll have to rely on Omaima's labs to see if we can push forward with uh, narrowing it down or like Robbie's dog honing in or zoning in on the toy or the diagnosis. I just love that. <laughs> I just love that example. I was watching over the weekend, I was watching my dog try to focus in on his toys as well. So it's always a delight if any of you have dogs. Back to you, Maima. Ravi, it's kind of incredible. He's doing it right now, actually. I'm not sure if you can see him, but he just found his ball right here. As you were narrating it, it was it was like the timing was impeccable. All right. Um, I'm going to give you the CBC and then an, and then an imaging. Uh, her hemoglobin was 12.9, platelets uh, 140,000, and the white, the white blood cell uh, 7,000. Um, shall I give you the uh, imaging or wait until you discuss the CBC? Oh, it doesn't tell you much. Yeah, let's see. Okay. Yeah, I think let's do the imaging. It doesn't. I, uh, so I was waiting for a big white count, but we don't have that. So again, we're sort of sort of not not really clear on what's going on. So maybe the imaging will help us. So we did a Doppler ultrasound and it showed an iliofemoral deep venous thrombosis. What do you think, Deborah? It was femoral. Um, yeah, so I think we we got the diagnosis of the the DVT with the Doppler ultrasound. The what we were thinking, uh, and the white blood cells being normal, we can. We, we doesn't have we we. We cannot start not think with that white blood cells being normal. We can think that cannot be infection. And yeah, and the patient, as Melina said, she's young. And I was thinking, and she doesn't take medication. And yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. So uh, it was interesting while while uh, Amaima was presenting the case, I was trying to think about what else could be causing this, but uh, two thoughts, something extra to this, not, not related to the DVT, that could cause uh, pain out of proportion to findings. Although in this patient, I'm not, not getting the sense of, that the pain is, is tremendously like out of, out of control. So one is uh, compartment syndrome, and the other would be something called complex pain, uh, regional pain syndrome and something I've never seen before, but it's definitely put, uh, it's in the in the schema for unilateral leg edema. And it's something where you would get uh, like burning or throbbing pain. There's pain. I don't know with this patient, the pain starts in the foot and moves upwards. But there's also something else that gives it away, changes in skin temperature. There's a alternating between sweaty and cold and also changing in skin color, which could become uh, blue or red. So there's something to think about if you sort of run out of ideas. But here we have a femoral DVT, and it is at risk of propagating since it is above the knee. And then we have to decide if, if this is provoked or non-provoked. I guess this is non-provoked. Sitting shouldn't really cause something of, to this degree. So I'm, I would be very worried that there's something behind the curtain that we have to pull back and see if there's a systemic disorder at play, is this a inkling of something going on in the background, like a malignancy, like a hematological process that could be causing this? And it could actually morph into a, a multi-systemic uh, disorder. So this may just be the, the start of something. Omaima, back to you. Okay, so the, the uh, prothrombin rate was elevated and her PCC was prolonged. And um, yeah, we then did a rheumatological workup, but since we did it uh, like on two times because uh, we work in a low resources setting, I would like to ask you which labs would you like, which uh, antibodies would you want to order first? Oh, wow, I usually hit the button and we get everything, but what do you think, Deborah? What would you, what would be the big one that we would want to get? Yeah, I think Anna, I think we can order uh, rheumatoid factor. And 
Yeah, I think ah, I think we could order the ones for. Sorry, I forgot. And we can order the ones for yeah. I think Anna, Inca, and and Phospholipid. Inca we can order, but I think I could wait a little bit. I order this first, and then maybe go for Anca. That that will be my thought. Yeah, I would also uh, worry about uh, lupus anticoagulant and uh, anticardiolipin. Um, I would do those and then see if those also come back positive or not. Protein C, protein S are the other ones. And factor five, Leiden deficiency. So I'm very interested in the antiphospholipid. Uh, so uh, we did ANA first and anti double stranded DNA, and they were both negative. And uh, we left the World Cup for antiphospholipid next, and we it was positive. Lupus anticoagulant was positive, anti-beta-2, glycoprotein was positive, and cardiolipin antibodies were also positive. Uh, I think like the uh, mistake that we did is once the patient reported to not have any miscarriage, to have irregular miscarriage, and no, there was no um, significant OBGYN history, we kind of put... Uh, and cyphospholipid syndrome second after the ruling out lupus. And yeah, it was positive, it was lupus. Uh, sorry, it was cyphospholipid syndrome, sorry. Wow. Deborah, what do you think? What did you learn from the case? Uh, I think uh, normally when we, we check for the lupus, we, we have the list of the, 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 the things that define lupus, no, the rash and everything. So I was not thinking as my first spot of lupus. So it's interesting how the presentation is and with the diagnosis. And yeah, I think that's that's what I learned. And um, how about you? Yeah, I think definitely uh, an approach to unilateral leg edema. It's not always a DVT, but here it was a DVT. But you also should explain explore the vast uh, possibilities or causes of uh, leg edema, which could be anything from musculoskeletal. Uh, uh, you could have um, uh, a Baker cyst causing pain and uh, swelling in the posterior part of the knee. Could you could have uh, a knee swelling or effusion, and it could look could make the leg look swollen, lymphedema, like you mentioned, and, and so on. And uh, however, uh, DVT is at the top of the list, and DVT in a young um, uh, female, you have to worry about maybe a non non provoked DVT, and you have to do some uh, digging to see what may be the cause. So, uh, like I, like I mentioned before, that this could be. A, a sign of of something that could be serious to come, which is the antiphospholipid syndrome. Somebody also had mentioned in the chat that we shouldn't shotgun everything. You're absolutely right about that. But um, uh, the, the, the and Sarah's mentioning something interesting. There's no OB history, but uh, what we sometimes read in the textbook and the and the criteria, you won't always you 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 will get these cases where it's very atypical and this patient hasn't had a, a, a pregnancy to really demonstrate to you that there's been a, 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 any uh, miscarriages. So you always have to think about that and think outside the box. The, what we learn in the, the vignettes that we usually get on questions on board exams don't always fit the patient. So it can still be very high in our list of possibilities. Omaima, back to you. Uh, so yes, uh, the patient was referred to a, a rheumatologist, and uh, she uh, she actually was thinking about switching to OCPs after her, her IUD, but that prob probably won't be possible after this episode. And um, yeah, this case also told me not to like uh, look for all the criteria that we read in textbooks. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great case. Uh, definitely, definitely learned a lot and enjoyed taking this diagnostic journey with Deborah. Uh, teaching points. We have Maddie doing the teaching points. Take it away, Maddie. Yeah, this was, oh my, this was such a fantastic case. And as always, Deborah and Robbie, really, really wonderful discussion. Um, so, you know, we, we started off by just uh, kind of taking a, a bird's eye view of clinical reasoning and saying that first we need, before we start solving the problem, we first need to define the problem. 
So when we got the chief concern of unilateral left leg swelling, we were curious, you know, that this represented some type of edema. But we talked about how um, you initially really want to ask about associated symptoms. So is this just localized to the left leg or is this part um, of a kind of systemic disease? So some things that we wanted to know were, are, was there evidence of erythema, any trauma history, any other signs of infection um, or you know, systemic signs of, of inflammation like fatigue and weight loss? Um, but we also kind of tried to anchor ourselves in base rate and thought about the most common causes of acute leg swelling or acute lower limb edema. We considered um, DVT right from the beginning, cellulitis, and, and even gout. And um, when considering DVT, we also want to know from the history um, if this person had a predisposition, a known predisposition to DVT. So was there a known history of a hypercoagulable state, which there wasn't in this case, any prior DVTs? Uh, malignancy, which can um, you know, make, make you hypercoagulable. And uh, beyond the acute causes, some chronic causes that you both, both mentioned were um, lymphedema and venous stasis, but really um, not wanting to miss um, a DVT kind of, because it can potentially be life-threatening. Uh, so when we got to the physical exam, we saw that there was diffuse um, erythema and a positive Homan sign which, um, you know, the diffuse erythema brought up a little bit of concern for cellulitis. And then the, the Holman sign we learned, which is kind of calf pain on dorsiflexion, we learned that um, it has a likelihood ratio around one. So it's really not so helpful in shifting the probability away from a DVT. Um, ultimately in the workup, when the Doppler ultrasound um, revealed a DVT, um, we both mentioned that the DVT is really not an endpoint diagnosis. You really need to ask the question, well, why does this young woman have a DVT in the first place? So again, we talked about some potential uh, conditions that could predispose her to a DVT. And you both mentioned um, uh, if this was provoked or unprovoked. Um, and in a young woman, uh, you both mentioned antiphospholipid syndrome, which was confirmed with the positive uh, cardiolipin antibodies and antiphospholipid antibodies. So amazing case, Amaima. Thank you so much for bringing this. Thank you, Amaima. That was really good. And something that we definitely do see uh, commonly in the in the hospital or in the uh, primary care office. So I really appreciate uh, having a, a visit uh, condition that we definitely will see uh, in the future again and again. Appreciate everybody coming in today. Thank you, uh, Madalena, for, for the teaching points and uh, everybody for the scribing and uh, Deborah for co-discussing. Fantastic co-discussion. Take care. Bye.